the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. <coughs> but whosoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it were better for him to have a great milestone, millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned into the depths of the sea. <coughs> In the book of the Apocalypse, in chapter 12, it says, Then a war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But the dragon was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven, and they lost their place in heaven, and they lost their place in heaven. And the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. But whosoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, better for him had he never been born than to have a great millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Today we celebrate the feast of the dedication of St. Michael. It is also the 16th Sunday after Pentecost, but since the feast of the dedication of St. Michael is a double of the first class, it takes precedence over the Sunday. And so we offer the Mass of St. Michael, the dedication of St. Michael, and the angels, the archangels, but you will notice that at the end of the Mass, we have a proper last gospel today. Instead of the normal gospel from St. John, we will read the gospel of the 16th Sunday after Pentecost. Today is the feast of the dedication of St. Michael. First of all, I wish a happy and a blessed feast day to Sister Mary Michael and to all those who bear the name Michael. You are in a battle for your salvation and may he defend you in the battle. <clears throat> and that's the first point I want to make. Make no mistake about it. We are born in a battle. The moment that we were baptized, we were entered into a cosmic battle for the salvation of the world. It's a battle between God and evil. <clears throat> and it's a battle where there are no demilitarized zones. It's a fight to the death. We are either on the side of God or we are God's enemy. You cannot be neutral with God. It is impossible. If you believe you're neutral, you're actually an enemy of God. So you cannot be at peace with God and enmity with God at the same time. Bear that in mind as we begin to talk or to reflect on this feast. <clears throat> the Feast of the Dedication of St. Michael. <clears throat> it has a history to it. The history goes back to the 5th century during the time of Pope Gelesius. There was a mountain or a hill in Italy called Gargano. And we know that according to the history, there was a herdsman who went out one day with his steer, with his animals, and one of them went up through these brush and into a cave. Well, the herdsman didn't want to go chasing after the steer that went into the cave, so he took an arrow and he threw the arrow into the cave, hoping that the arrow would hit the wall of the cave, make a loud sound, and scare the steer back out. But what happened instead is the arrow went into the cave, turned around, and came back at him even faster than he had thrown it. It scared the living daylights out of him. It would have scared the living daylights out of me. And what does he do? He was a man of faith. <clears throat> See the difference of the people of those times and the people of these times. As a man of faith, he went to the local bishop and told the bishop what had happened. And the bishop said, this is a sign. But in order for us to read the sign... I want everyone to fast and to pray for three days. Fasting and praying are necessary in order for us to be able to read the signs of the times in a spiritual way. 
Fasting and praying are necessary for us to be able to discern what is of God and what is not of God. Fasting and praying helps us to dispose ourselves totally and completely to the living God. And so the people fasted and prayed for three days. Then they went back to the mouth of the cave, the bishop with them. And at that point, St. Michael appeared to the bishop and asked the bishop to build a church for him on this spot. And St. Michael said, I am telling you that I have a special love for the people of God, and I will defend those who honor me in this place. And a church was built on that spot. This feast was initiated for the dedication of that church, and it has spread through the church. Um, at one time, they had this feast really for all of the archangels. Then it was reduced to yet again the dedication of St. Michael. And then in a recent liturgical reform, they've added all the archangels again. But that's what this feast is about. Calling on God in thanksgiving for the protection of the archangel Michael and the building of a church in that spot. What are the angels? What are they? Well, to make it simple, the angels are pure spirits. They're different from us. St. Thomas Aquinas teaches that when God created, he created different kinds of beings. There are eternal beings, immortal, no beginning and no end. God is immortal, right? He's eternal. There's no beginning to God, there's no end, period. Then there are mortal beings, those which have a beginning and an end. And then there are eternal beings, those that have a beginning but no end. God is immortal. He has no beginning and no end. The angels are eternal. They are created by God, but they have no end. They live eternally. And then you have us, really, and animals too. We are mortal. We have a beginning and an end, but man is different from the animals in that while we have a beginning and an end, we're mortal beings, we have immortal souls. And so there's no end. So what we do in our bodies is going to affect our souls for eternity. Think about that in every choice you make. What you do in your body affects your soul for eternity. So <coughs> God is an eternal being. The angels are eternal. They are pure spirit. They are pure intellect. The Old Testament tells us that uh, the angels are created by God for a particular purpose, to be ministers of his will. Because they are pure intellects, they know the consequence of their decision before they make the decision. See, you and me, we struggle to know the consequences of our decisions before we make them, right? But we don't always know all the consequences of our decisions. That's why we try to use discernment and prayer and fasting. But the angels know the consequences of their decisions before they make them. Which makes me really wonder about how stupid Satan must have been. Here he is, pure spirit, pure intellect, eternal, created by God, but forever. <coughs> he knows that there is no way he can beat God who is holy, immortal, eternal. And yet he rises up against him. How stupid is that? Pride is what causes him to fall because pride blinds him. The angels are naturally invisible to the human eye. But they are all around us constantly carrying out the tasks that God has given them. Traditionally, the angels are classified in what we call nine choirs or nine ranks or nine orders, right? Each angel is created for a specific purpose within the cosmos. So every angel that God has created has a specific purpose, each one of the thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of angels. Every one of them has a specific purpose. They are messengers. They are watchers or supervisors of God. 
They are eternal hosts, the military hosts of God. We know on the authority of Holy Scripture itself that these nine orders or choirs of angels are as follows, starting from the highest to the lowest. You probably know this from your catechism class. If you don't know it, you should. The seraphim, the cherubim, the thrones, the power, the dominations, the principalities, the powers, the virtues, the archangels, and the angels. Each of these choirs is given a specific task by God, and each angel in each of these choirs has a specific task given to them by God. So the first grouping are the cherubim, or the seraphim, the cherubim, and the throne. The seraphim is the highest choir. It's the closest to God. The name seraphim means burning ones. They are bright with light and burning with love for God. The seraphim are the closest to him in heaven. And so they comprehend or behold him with a clarity that is not the same for others. Lucifer, it is believed, was one of the seraphim. His very name, Lucifer, Lucifer, means the light bearer. He was one of them. And because he was so close to God, his rebellion caused him to be so far from God. And now in his anger, all he can do to get even is to try and destroy what is most precious to God, mankind. Lucifer will never, ever, ever come into the presence of God again, or into heaven, except for the eternal judgment that's already upon him. And the only consolation that Lucifer gets is to see souls deprived of God. Michael, it is believed, was one of the princes of the uh, seraphim. He is a seraphic prince. And his name, Quis Ud Deus, who is like unto God, Michael is the one who does the great battle. So, the seraphim, the word means the burning ones. Burning with a passion and love for God. Now, you and me, we cannot be seraphim. But, by grace, we can burn with a passion for God. We can burn with a passion for God. The next choir, or the next grouping, is the cherubim. Cherubim literally means the fullness of wisdom. They too contemplate God, but more in his providence than in himself. You see, the seraphim contemplate God in himself. And the cherubim contemplate God in his providence, his caring. The next grouping, the thrones, they symbolize juridical power. They contemplate God in his judgments and in God's power. The thrones are the angels of pure humility. They are angels of peace and angels of submission. They reside in the area of the cosmos where the material begins to take shape. The thrones are necessary for access to God. Our prayers literally pass through the thrones on the way up to God. The next grouping of dominations and principalities and powers. These, these choirs fulfill God's providential plan for the universe. They're kind of like middle management. The dominions are the angels of leadership. They regulate the duties of all the angels, making known the commandments of God. Now the principalities are interesting because they refer to a type of spiritual being which is now hostile to God. It has been said that one third of the choirs of angels fell with Satan. That one third of the choirs of angels rebelled against God. Many of them were the principalities. Interestingly, the principalities are made for Christ, 
for Christ and by Christ. Given their hostility to God and humans due to sin, Christ's ultimate rule over them expresses the reign of his lordship. Okay, the powers. We're almost done. I'm going to make sure you know each of these choirs. The powers of the warrior angels against, uh, against evil. The, the powers defend the cosmos and humanity. The powers are warrior angels. They're known as potentates. We need them. We call upon them. The virtues are known as the spirits of motion of all things. They are sometimes referred to as the shining ones. They're in charge of miracles and providing courage and grace and valor. So the very word virtue means strength. And so when we call upon God asking him to give us strength and valor and courage, he sends the virtues to be with us and do it. Lastly, these choirs order human affairs. The archangels carry important messages directly. The ordinary guardian angels look after us. And it's also said that every guardian angel must intervene to protect you at least once in your life. Directly. It's also said, I can't prove it, but I hope it's true, that when you're ordained a priest, you get a second guardian angel because you need it. Lord knows I do. So the archangels are the chief leading angels. So Michael, who is like unto God, he has been invoked as the patron and the protector of the church since the time of the apostles. He so loves the honor of God. He so burns with a passion for our Heavenly Father that he will go to war to protect everything that is sacred to God. And the church and the salvation of mankind is sacred to God. His name means who is like unto God. The angel Gabriel, the name means the strength of God. When God has a special mission to be carried out, he sends Gabriel. It's Gabriel who goes to Our Lady and says, The Holy Spirit will overshadow you and you will conceive and have a son. Gabriel is the strength of God. And then we have Raphael who is the medicine of God, the healer. These They deliver the prayers of ours to God and God's answers and messages to human beings. So these are what the angels are and we celebrate them today. Because here is the reality of all of what's happening. We are born into a spiritual conflict. And this conflict is for the salvation of mankind. It's for the glorification of God. It is between light and darkness, between good and bad. We're born into it. See, if we are in a cosmic battle, we are, we are not alone. The spiritual writers say that the one-third of the angels, these angelic beings, fell from heaven. And they are demons, and they're out to get us, and they're all around us in this battle. But we are not alone in the fight because we are baptized. And we have the grace of the sacraments, the teaching of the church, and we have the holy angels to guard us. So we have all of those choirs of angels. We've got the seraphim, the cherubim, the thrones, the dom dominations, the principalities, the powers, the virtues, angels, archangels. All of them are there with us doing battle for our salvation and for the good of the church and the world. So that's what this is all about today. To come into the presence of God and to say, angels adore you, archangels fall before you, the cherubim, the seraphim, the principalities, the powers, all of these angels, O oh God, adore you and glorify you. They are so close to you, and yet as beautiful as they are, O oh Lord my God, I am more precious to you than they, because I am made in the image and the likeness of your Son and of you. You have granted me a mortal being, an immortal soul. And so I come into your presence and I fall before you. Today I take Michael to be my special patron. Think about this. Saint Michael remained true to God when thousands of other angels became faithless to him. 
And so we say, God, I want to be like St. Michael. I want to remain faithful to you in spite of the apostasy that's going on in the church and in the world today. I want to remain faithful to you like St. Michael so that no matter what people do or say, I am yours. That's why we have no choice but to know the faith and know it well, to submit ourselves to uh, grace and the sacraments all over again, to fast and to pray. Another consideration we have to think about is this. St. Michael is exalted because of his fidelity, right? Satan and all the other angels are cast out because of one sin. Just one sin. Only one sin and they're cast out of heaven eternally and sent to hell. Think about that. These angels who are now demons and they were seraphim, cherubim, etc. They are cast out of heaven for one sin. A single sin is punished with eternal damnation. And their sin is only in thought. Think about you and me. Think about it. This is why, remember, and we're taught this in the Catechism, that if you die with one unrepentant sin, even if you live the most beautiful life of service and goodness and kindness all over the place, if you die with one unrepentant sin, you are shut out of the kingdom of God. And when somebody says, oh, God wouldn't do that, you can say, well, wait, now he did it with the angels. They only committed one sin, and it was in thought. You know, when you read about the, the battle going on in heaven, it says, all of heaven went silent. Why? Because all of this was happening in the intellect, in thought, in thought. So there's a second consideration. If that doesn't put you on the right road, nothing will. One unrepentant sin sends us out of the kingdom of God and into the dark of hell. So that's what this, fe this feast is about. <coughs> In the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 1, it says, At that time, Michael... The great prince who protects God's people will arise. There will be a time of great distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book of life, will be delivered because Michael will defend them. So we must pray that our names are written in the book of life, huh? And if you are more fortunate than most and you have the a grace of attending the funeral or having a funeral in the old rite, what does the antiphon say? May Michael, the bearer, come and lead you directly into heaven. So today, let's think about the angels. They battle with us and they battle for us. They are pure intellects, we are not. But we are mortal beings with immortal souls. And with the help of grace, through the sacraments from Almighty God, with increased prayer and knowledge of the faith and the Word of God, we can make sure that we are on the road to heaven. Many are rebelling against our blessed Lord, against His church. Let's pray today that we have the grace to be like Michael and to be faithful. And let's also remember that one unrepentant sin puts us into hell. One unrepentant sin. Dear God, through the intercession of St. Michael and all of the archangels, angels, etc., please, through their intercession, give to us the grace we need to know you better, love you more fervently, and serve you more faithfully. We thank you, Almighty God, for the gift of life. We thank you for the immortality of our souls. We thank you for the gift of faith. We ask you now to give us the grace to respond to all that you offer us so that we spend eternity in heaven with you and the angels. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.